You're listening to the Based on History podcast. All units, Irene. I say again, Irene. And we're going to kick him in the ass. We're going to kick the hell out of him all the time. And we're going to go through him like crap through a goose. You tell him I'm coming. And hell's coming with me, you hear? Hell's coming with me. That they may take our lives. But they'll never take our freedom. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to the Based on History podcast. I'm your host, John Nydick, and today we have another Based on History mini for you. And this is going to cover the Ionian Revolt and the events leading up to our next film, which is 300. So to give a little context about what's happening in the area before the events of the Battle of Thermopylae and the 300 Spartans and Gerard Butler comes from a man named Herodotus and he was he is considered to be the father of modern day history he's the only primary account that we have from this time period he was born around and lived in this area and was a contemporary to these events he actually grew up in Ionia, where this revolt is going to take place. He is criticized by modern historians and even some later ancient historians for his inaccuracies and embellishments and things that he pretty much just made up. But from archaeological facts and other histories that we can tell used him as a reference, we know that he did get a lot right. And so even though there's a lot of things that are wrong with, with his history, we can use them as a baseline for what actually happened. He's more of a storyteller. His histories were performed for live audiences and theaters. And so he's doing things to kind of get the crowd going and play to the crowd and make it more dramatic and or scary or exciting, you know, think of it more, almost more as like a, a play than reading a history book. But at its core, the events and the places are more or less all correct. So what is the Ionian Revolt and where does it take place? If you've seen the movie 300, you already kind of have an idea of the area that we're talking about. We're talking about Greece and Ionia in particular is modern-day Turkey, mainly the western coast of modern-day Turkey. So kind of the boundaries of the Aegean Sea. You've got Greece on one side, you've got Turkey on the other, and then the islands in the Aegean in between. And that's where this story is going to take place. If you want to look at a map or, you know, to kind of check and see before you listen, that that's the area that you're going to look at where the area that it's all going to take place. Now, why are the Ionians in revolt and how are the Ionians even there in the first place? So if we go back even further in time to archaic Greece, which is ruled by these people called the Mycenaeans, and they are Mycenaean Greeks. These are the people that would have been in the you know, Homer's Iliad, the Siege of Troy, the initial colonizing of Greece and the Aegean and everything like that. And that would take place during the Bronze Age. The Mycenaeans were there, you know, throughout the Bronze Age. But then we get to the Late Bronze Age and there's what historians call the Late Bronze Age Collapse. And there's many reasons why this Bronze Age collapse of civilization happened. Some of them they think it's crop failure and drought combined with what historians call the sea peoples coming down from Europe, sweeping through the Mediterranean into Egypt and the Levant and all of that area. And so after the collapse, people began to spread out 
and colonize and settle in different areas. So these Ionians come from an area in Greece called Ionia, and that's why they're called Ionian Greeks. They move from Greece across the Aegean and settle on these islands and then later on along the western coast of Turkey. There's a couple different groups of people that come across, but to make things simple, we're just going to refer to them all as Ionians. Like I said, there's a few different groups and they all have their different histories and lineages and things like that. But for the purposes of this podcast and just make it easy, everyone along here is going to be an Ionian Greek. And they are Greek. They are Greek in appearance. They are Greek in culture. They are Greeks. Okay, so now that we've established that there are Greeks in this area, why are they in revolt? Well, for a while after the Bronze Age collapse, they lived as independent city-states that were aligned more or less via culture. They were all independent, but they were united in the fact that they were all Greeks. Now, over the course of history, there was a king named Crassus who ruled a kingdom called Lydia, which is just to the east of Ionia in Turkey. And the king of Lydia conquers the Ionian Greeks and incorporates that area into his kingdom. Later on, the Persian Empire, which has replaced the Assyrian Empire, is expanding. And the Persian Empire under Cyrus the Great goes to war with Crassus and Lydia. And Cyrus the Great and his Persians defeat the Lydians and then incorporate the former Lydian Empire into the Persian Empire. And therefore now, these Ionian Greeks are under Persian rule. And they don't really like it. They're independent. They've always wanted to be independent. They don't view themselves as Persian subjects. They view themselves as Greeks. They Their ancestry goes back to Greece by this time period. Mainland Greece is establishing itself via its own independent city-states like Sparta and Athens and Thebes and Argos and a bunch of other ones. And the Ionians kind of see themselves almost similar, similar to the mainland Greeks, but yet they're under Persian rule. And so there's, it's very, it's the political state in Ionia is very unsettled and kind of rife for rebellion in the first place. And so what the Persians do to gain control and maintain peace or control over the Ionians is they establish these men who are Ionian themselves as tyrants in each of these city-states, or cities, excuse me, and they their job is to rule them. They have absolute rule over the cities themselves, and each of these tyrants reports to a satrap, in the capital of the area, which in this case is Sardis, which is just a little bit east of Ionia. It's still in Turkey. And then that satrap, who's in charge of the overall area, reports to the king of Persia. You can kind of think of it like president, governor, mayor would be a very you know simplistic but easy way to kind of view these, view this ruling structure of Ionia, a Persian Ionia. And Most of the Ionians don't particularly like their tyrants, and they are looking to break away even in the first place. This revolt never would have happened if the people in Ionia weren't ready for it in the first place. And we'll get to why and how that happens in just a minute. But just know that there's underlying resentment toward the Persians that allows these key people to take advantage of that and start and start this revolt. Cyrus the Great, who was the first Persian king and conquered this area, has died. I know that seems very fast, but we're covering just the time period that leads up to the film. There are more in-depths about the Persian Empire that are great, but here we're going to mainly just kind of hit some high points leading up to, and then we'll dig into the Ionian Revolt itself. So Cyrus has died. There's been a few other kings, and now we get to a king called Darius. Darius is in control of this massive, massive empire that he has consolidated into different areas, and he 
is viewed by historians as kind of a CEO of the Persian Corporation Empire. They, there are some people who have called him you know, Darius the shopkeeper. But he's usually pretty fair-handed with the people that he deals with. The Persians, in terms of ancient kingdoms, are fairly lenient, especially compared to the Assyrians who they took over. Now, they still exact punishment in ways that we would view as very barbaric in, in our you know society today. But all things considered, when you're looking throughout history, the Persians are fairly fair, just, and lenient on people they conquer, people that rebel, and people that they're fighting in general. So Darius has consolidated his empire, added a few little pieces here and there. And the Persian empire at this time spans from the edges of India in the east up to the Aral, Caspian, and Black Sea in the north, all the way down to the edges of the Saudi Arabian desert, and then into Egypt, as well as all of modern-day Turkey and even parts of Thrace, which would be like Bulgaria in southern, you know, southeastern Europe. So it's the largest empire up to date, up to this time, and they're looking to expand. So Darius and the Persian army cross into Europe near modern-day Istanbul, and they go to war with these Thracian tribes that are in the area. And a man named Hysterius is an Ionian Greek who's an advisor to the king of Persia, and he is rewarded for his aid that he helps out with during this campaign along the Danube. And he is gifted a city in Thrace to basically be his own. Well, he begins to fortify it and put walls around it, and some of the Persian generals see this, and they're worried that he's going to try and break away from the Persians, and so Darius rewards, I'm using air quotes, him by making him a palace assistant, but he can't leave the capital of Persia, which is Susa, which is in modern-day Iran, and so he removes him from his city in the west and takes him all the way to the center of the empire so he can't cause trouble with the other Ionians or people in the area. Now, Hysterius was one of these tyrants that was put in control of these Ionian cities, and the city that he was in charge of was Miletus. Now that that he is in Susa, his son-in-law, Aristagoras, is put in control of the city of Miletus. He's a fairly young tyrant, and he's looking for ways to establish himself in his own right to show his power and establish his control over Miletus and that area in Ionia because the Ionian Greeks don't like the tyrants. And he's looking for ways to show this. An opportunity presents itself for Aristagoras to do this. And there's an island in the Aegean, kind of right in the middle. It's a very strategic island called Naxos. And Naxos has just kicked out some of their ruling elite and establishing a new government of control over the island. Naxos is an independent city-state, just like Sparta is an independent city-state and Athens is an independent city-state. Greece is not unified the way it is today, and it won't be for a while. So, these ruling elites from Naxos go to Ionia and meet with Aristagoras, and he tells them that he can help them get back in power. And so Aristagoras goes to the satrap in Sardis, which is like the governor of the area, and convinces him to help fund an army of Persians and Ionian Greeks to sail to Naxos and put these guys back in power And he's going to repay him with some of the loot and plunder and spoils of war that they get from from Naxos. And they both can get rich and they both can show Darius that, hey, we've expanded the Persian Empire and I've helped consolidate my power in Miletus. They get permission from Darius 
they get some ships, they get an army, and they sail to an island called Chios. Now, they do this for a couple of reasons. One, so that they don't look like they're sailing directly to Naxos. And two, so that they can get good winds to sail directly down to that island. Now, while they're there, there's some discord with the commanders. Herodotus makes it much more dramatic. But regardless, there is some discord. And by the time they get to Naxos, the, the Naxians have been warned that they're on their way. They've had time to fortify the city and get provisions. And the Aristagoras and Persian forces don't have enough to take the city. So they settle in to a siege. It lasts for four months, and the siege is a complete failure. They don't take the island. They have to leave, and they just leave the Naxos, or the the, the ruling class that they were going to put back in place, they just leave them on the island and sail home. It's a complete and utter failure. So when Aristagoras gets back home to Miletus, he's worried about being removed from power. He's encouraged by his father-in-law, Hysterius, to start a revolt. Hysterius is hoping that a revolt in Ionia will allow him to convince Darius that he can go back and help put it down so that he can escape his kind of imprisonment in Susa. Aristagoras meets with some of the elites in Miletus, and they decide that they are going to revolt against the Persian Empire and establish their independence. He kind of ceremoniously resigns as tyrant of Miletus, but is still in overall command of the city and the troops. They send out word. They spread the revolt. All A lot of other Ionian cities rebel. They expel their tyrants and kick them out, and they begin to seek aid along the Ionian coast to other cities, as well as sending a, or people to seek aid from mainland Greece. Aristagoras goes to the two main city-states in Greece, that would be Sparta and Athens. He's not able to gain support from Sparta, but he is able to gain support from Athens. He also gains support from a smaller city-state called Eritrea, just north of Athens. But one of the reasons the Athenians think it's a good idea to help the Ionian revolt is that about 20 years earlier, the Athenians themselves had kicked out a tyrant and just formed their democracy. Now, it's not like any democracy that you or I would recognize today, but it's kind of the beginning stages of this experiment of democracy within Athens. And they had looked for help from the Persian Empire. They ended up not needing it, and the Persians had kind of told them, hey, put your tyrant back in power or else, you know, kind of a thing. So the Athenians were already kind of at odds with the Persian Empire. They were worried the Persians were going to come to Athens and punish them and they were going to be at war. So they thought, hey, if we can kind of keep them at bay, we're going to keep Athens safe. So the Athenians send 20 ships and the Eritreans send five ships. Now, that doesn't seem like a whole lot, and it's not, especially when you view it against what they're going to be fighting in the Persian army. But kind of respectively to the city-states themselves, it's a fair amount of people that they're sending of their own to go and fight the Persian army. Now, the Eritreans and the Athenians sailed to a city called Ephesus, which is in Ionia. They meet up with the Miletian army. Aristagoras appoints his brother as general, and they are going to march on the satrap at Sardis, the governing, the governing city, the capital of the area. So this army marches on Sardis unopposed. And when they get there, they sack the city pretty easily. Now, the satrap and his army fall back to the Agropolis, which is kind of like the citadel, and the Ionians are not able to break in. And we're not exactly sure how but a fire somehow starts in the city and sets the city ablaze. The Ionians fall out of the city as well as the Persian force. And the Persian force gets ready for battle, but the Ionians decide, hey, we're not going to fight here. We weren't able to loot the city. Let's fall back. So the Ionian forces begin heading back towards Ephesus, which is along the western coast of Ionia. A Persian cavalry force came to support Sardis 
and the satrap. And this cavalry force begins to track the Ionians back to Ephesus. The Persian cavalry is able to catch up with them around the city of Ephesus, and there's a battle. The Greeks, although they have time to form up, they're pretty much caught unawares by this cavalry force, and they are routed and destroyed. The Persian cavalry was a kind of a missile cavalry, so they would have been using bows, maybe javelins, and kept the Ionian forces from being able to engage them and just rained arrows down on them. We don't have a ton of information on the battle itself, just like with a lot of these battles, but we know that it was Persian cavalry that caught up with the Ionians near Ephesus and routed and killed a lot of Ionians. Now, at this point, the Athenians and the Eritreans realize, hey, this is not going to be quite as easy as we thought it was going to be, not quite as easy as Aristagoras sold it to us. So they pack up and they sell home. So now the Ionians are on their own. They've got no support other than the other Ionian cities and Ionian forces in the area. Now, this cavalry force, we can tell that it's not that big of an army because nothing else happens in the area for a little bit. And this allows the Ionian revolt to spread some you know, propaganda throughout the area, if you will. Although Sardis wasn't a major victory for the Ionians, the fact that they did set it ablaze and kind of sack it shows everyone else in the area that, hey, they do they might have the power to break away and, and defeat the Persians and get their own independence. So the Ionian revolt begins to spread all throughout the area. It spreads down south into an area called Caria, and these are another group of Greeks that had come over with the Ionians and settled in the south. It spreads up towards the Hellespont, which is kind of northern Turkey, right around you know, getting up close towards, you know, Istanbul and that area. Some Thracian tribes that had settled in the area go back and start causing trouble up in Thrace. And also the island of Cyprus revolts kind of on their own. So now you've got this whole entire area of these Greek settled Persian occupied areas that are all in revolt. And so now it's not just one city or one little area. It's the entire Ionian coast is in full revolt of the Persian rule. So the Persians begin to form an army to go back and put down this revolt. The Ionians, realizing that they don't have quite the offensive capabilities that they thought they might have had, fall back on a defensive strategy. So the Ionian forces are going to fortify these cities and they're going to hold them from per the Persian army that's coming to get them. The Persian army arrives in Sardis and they begin a three-pronged attack throughout the area to reconquer it. It's a little bit more complicated than this, but we're just just to make it simple, there's one army that goes to the north, there's one army that's kind of in the center in the Ionian center area, and there's one army that heads south into Korea. The army in the north reconquers a lot of the cities along the Hellespont, which is this little strip of water that separates Turkey from Europe. Now, today it's all modern-day Turkey, but back then it was a major obstacle that kept armies from crossing in that area. And so there's a bunch of little cities along there that the Persians go up and begin to take one after the other in pretty quick succession. The middle army in Ionia itself begins to keep these Ionian forces bottled up and has a presence in the area, but we don't really know exactly a lot of what was going on. The southern Persian army begins to move towards Caria, and the Carian forces mobilize, and they meet at a place called the White Pillars, and they have a war council. And this war council is to decide if they are going to cross this river and fight the Persians with the river to their back, or if they're going to form up on the southern side and let the Persians cross and have the Persians fight with the river at their back. The Ionian forces decide to let the Persians cross so that if they achieve a victory, it will be maximized by the fact that the Persians have to retreat across this river and they're going to be able to slaughter them and it will be a, a much bigger victory for the Ionians. The problem with this strategy is that you have to have the victory first. 
and the Ionians are going to find that out at the Battle of the River Meander. And the Persians cross the river, they form up, and the battle begins. We don't know exactly the numbers of these, but it's fairly evenly matched, at least at the beginning. It's a hard fight at the beginning, but the Persian forces gain the upper hand and rout the Ionian army. Herodotus puts the casualties for the Ionians at 10,000 and the Persian casualties at around 2,000. We don't know if those numbers are anywhere near accurate, but known for, you know, Herodotus is known for blowing numbers out of proportion. So we can assume it's a little bit smaller than that, but re- but regardless, it's a big defeat for the Ionians. The Ionians fall back to a place called Labarunda, where there's a sanctuary of Zeus there, and they debate whether or not they're going to continue the revolt or they're going to surrender to the Persians. They send out some messengers for help, and the Miletians, which is the city that started this whole thing, send some reinforcements down to them. So now the Carians are feeling good. They've got some reinforcements. They've regrouped. They're ready for the second battle against the Persians. And the Battle of Larunda goes pretty much exactly how the first battle goes, except Herodotus says the casualties for the Ionians were even worse. So now the Carians fall back into Caria proper now to kind of set up their defenses and figure out what they're going to do next. The Miletian forces go home, and around this time is when Aristagoras realizes, hey, things are not going very well. I'm out of here. And he flees up to Thrace on his own with some of some of his loyal followers and begins a rebellion up in Thrace. And he's fighting other Thracian tribes and t- trying to establish his control over the area and form his own little kingdom. You know, he's the guy who started this and when things start going badly, he's out. Now, the Ionians are still in revolt and they're kind of holding their own. The Persian army in the north, the commander gets sick and dies. There's not a whole lot happening for the Persian commander in the center. So really, they're really gaining ground for the Persians in the south. Now, before we get to this last battle in the south, we're going to go to the island of Cyprus. Now, they revolted kind of on their own. There were no messengers sent there, but they heard about what was going on. And they said, hey, you know what? We're going to revolt too. We're, we're Ionian Greeks as well. And we don't like being under the Persian rule. Time to rebel. And so the king of Cyprus, whose name was Gorgos, his brother replaces him as king, kicks him out, and conquers the island of Cyprus except for this one little holdout which he begins to siege. Now, the Persians send a force to reconquer Cyprus. The Miletians send a fleet and army down to Cyprus to help. The Ionian fleet defeats the Persian fleet, which was made up of mainly Phoenicians. But on the island itself, the Ionian army loses a major battle to the Persians when some of the Greek forces turn sides during the middle of the battle. The Ionian king is killed, his brother is put back on the throne, and the Persians capture Cyprus. Their, their freedom lasted roughly a year, not, not quite a year. So now we go back to Caria and the southern Persian army, which has just had two major victories against the Ionians and is now about to break down into the area of Caria where the cities are and start pacifying them. Now the Carians have a new commander. They've reformed their army and they realize they're not able to fight the Persians in a pitched battle. And so what they do is in a mountainous area, all of this kind of area of Turkey is fairly mountainous once you get off the coast, they set up an ambush. And the Persian army is marching at night, and the Carian forces launch this ambush on them. And we don't know a ton about it as about this battle as well, but it's a crushing, crushing defeat for the Persians. And... Th- At least three of the commanders of the army are killed. Herodotus makes it seem like every single Persian was killed. We know that's not true. But regardless, it was a massive, massive defeat for this army. They lose their commander. They have to fall back. And now we reach this area, which is kind of like a stalemate. 
for the remainder of that year and a lot of the next year. The Persian army up north is kind of stalled with their commander dying of illness. Now the southern armies had a crushing defeat and now we, we really only have the center army and we don't really know how big these armies are. But regardless, both sides kind of form into a generally peaceful time frame while both sides regroup. The Ionians are fortifying their cities and figuring out what they're going to do. The Persians are rebuilding their army. They're going to come back when, they, when they've when they got all of that ready to go. The year after, the Persians arrive with another army. No more of this broad-scale tactics. They're going straight for the heart of the Ionian rebellion. They're going to the city where it all started. They're going to Miletus. The Ionians realize this. They decide that they are going to try and fight the Persians in a naval battle. They think they've got a better chance of fighting the Persians on the water than they do on land. It hasn't gone very well for them in the past, so they abandon the city to the citizens itself to defend, and the army and the navy go to an island called Laid. They're going to form up there. Now, the Persians get there, and they're a little worried about fighting the Ionians on water. The Ionian fleet already beat the Persian fleet one time down near Cyprus, and they don't don't want to take any chances. So the Persians take some time before this battle and send out emissaries to see if they can turn any of the Ionian forces against and bring them back into the Persian fold. They convince the island of Samos, who has supplied some ships and men to the Ionian revolt, to turn on them during the battle. So the day of the battle comes... And it's a pretty big naval battle. The Ionians have somewhere around the 350 ships range. And the Persians have roughly 600 ships. And these are triremes. So they're, these, they're powered by rows. And they're going to ram each other. Or try and skim along the sides of these ships. And cut off all the oars so that they can't maneuver very well. They also kind of, you know, what we would say are Marines, where they get up alongside the ship and then soldiers go on the other side and, and, you know, fight on top of the ships. So that's kind of the naval battle style tactics that we're looking at. So the Persians outnumber them two to one, but the Ionians have proven themselves to be good naval fighters. Well, they line up for battle and they're sailing towards each other. And this is when the fleet from Samos turns around and flees. Another island nation called Lesbos had sent a fleet down to help the Ionians as well. They see this happen, and they turn around and flee, except for a couple of their ships that refuse to leave the Ionians, and they stay to fight. Now, the battle itself is still a hard-fought battle. The Ionian fleet breaks through the Persian lines at one point in time, but they just can't exploit it. Because there's so many Persian ships, and the Persians overwhelm them and utterly destroy the Greek forces. Now the city of Miletus is on its own, it's completely surrounded, and a siege ensues on the city of Miletus. Around this time, Hysterius, old Aristagoras' father-in-law, convinces the king of Persia to let him go and help snuff out the remaining parts of the rebellion in Ionia, the other, the other places. He shows up, and the Persian commanders and generals aren't having any of it. They don't believe it. They think he's just going to incite more riot, more rebellion, and try and take over. They're just getting close to finishing this up, and he shows up, and he's going to start it all over again. So he kind of gets scared for his life, takes some ships, gets some followers, and goes up to modern-day Istanbul. At the time, it's called Byzantium. Conquers that city, which is right there along the crossing from Turkey over to Europe. And he begins operating in that area as a pirate. You know, it's it's not really helping the Ionian revolt directly, but he's against the Persians. And he starts raiding, you know, commercial vessels and, and things like that. But he doesn't really have a, an effect on the Ionian revolt itself. So, back to the city of Miletus, where it all started. The Persians have it surrounded. They're sieging the city. And we're told that they sapped the walls, which probably means they dug underneath it, they mined underneath the walls, put these supports up, and then they all you know, came out of the hole, pulled the supports back, and the wall comes crumbling down. They sacked the city, 
Herodotus says they kill all the men, enslave all the women and children, and send a bunch of them back to Susa to be slaves to the king of Persia. We don't know exactly what happened, but we do know that Miletus was almost completely destroyed. They razed the city to the ground. And Miletus was one of the most prosperous cities in Ionia. It was a key city in the area. It was a massive city. And we know that for centuries, Miletus didn't recover, and it never really recovered to its, you know, more or less former glory. So they did destroy it. They did kill a lot of people. And now the Ionian revolt is essentially crushed. And the Persians begin to methodically move through the area and snuff out all of the remaining resistance, taking each city, putting Persians back in control. Now, our old friend Hysterius hears about this, and so he sails down from Byzantium along the Ionian coast and begins to raid. He raids some islands, he gets some more followers, he gets some more ships, but he has to feed all of these men. So he's forging and raiding the mainland coast of Ionia. Well, one time, him and his men are forging for food, and there's a Persian army that is nearby, and they get caught. At the Battle of Melene, the remaining Ionian rebellious forces are crushed. Apparently, it's a pretty hard-fought battle. It's a long battle. But in the end, the Persians destroy the remaining Ionian army. They capture Hysterius, and they put him on a spike. They cut off his head, and they send it back to Darius. That is the last remaining operational Ionian force in the area. The Persians begin to slowly and methodically go to each island, go to each city, and basically march across the areas, finding all of the little pockets of resistance. The Persians reinstate the tyrants in all of the cities, put them back under control. But at the end of that year, the new satrap at Sardis calls representatives from all the Ionian cities that have revolted, more or less, and they have a council. And the Persians say, okay, what can we do to make sure this doesn't happen again? How can we get back? How can we get y'all back on our good side? How can we get back on your good side? And they talk about it. And the Ionians tell them what they want. And the Persians give it to them. They remove all of the tyrants from the area. They allow the Ionian city-states to establish local democracies to govern the cities themselves. Now they still report to the satrap and to the Persian king. But in their cities themselves, they're ruling as a democracy. The satrap in Sardis also redoes the tribute system for the Ionian cities and makes it proportional to the wealth of those cities so that they can pay their taxes and pay their tribute and it not be that big of a burden on them. And we can tell that this works because later on when the Persians are going to invade Greece proper, the Ionians support the Persians. The Ionians send their army to fight alongside the Persian army. So once again, we see that the Persians get high marks for leniency, being fair, being just. Now, they still destroy Miletus. They still put a big population of Ionians in slavery. They're still cutting off heads and putting people on spikes. But once that's all done, they're trying to find a reasonable solution to make the area profitable for them, profitable to the people that live in there. So, you know, all things considered, Persians are, are a little more lenient than some other kingdoms in that area. Now, the Persian king Darius did not forget that the Athenians and the Eritreans had sent forces to help the Ionians. He's punished all the Ionian rebels. Now, Persia is going to punish the Greek rebels. And so, he begins putting together a fleet to sail around the Aegean and punish these two city-states. And basically kind of test the waters of what is it going to take to conquer Greece in that area. He puts in charge a general called Mardonius, and an army and a navy sail and march around the coast of the Aegean. They reconquer Thrace. Oh, side note, Aristagoras, our old friend Aristagoras who started this whole mess, up in Thrace during this time, he is killed besieging a Thracian city, 
and that's the last we hear of him. So he started this whole mess, he goes to play on his own, and then he gets killed doing it. Now, back to the Persian first invasion of Greece. They're sailing and marching around the coastline. They reconquer the Thracian area that was kind of already under Persian control. But then, you know, Aristagoras started these rebellions. They reconquer Thrace. They get to a little kingdom called Macedonia. You may have heard of that, that one before. And Macedonia submits. Their king, Alexander I, bends the knee to Mardonius and submits to the Persian rule. And now Thrace and Macedonia are both vassal states of the Persian Empire. The fleet is rounding a point along the Greek coast called Mount Athos. And there's a major, major storm, and it wrecks the fleet. Herodotus says something like 20,000 men drown. We don't know exactly how many, but regardless, it's a massive number of men that drown. And it's enough of a deterrent that the Persian army and the remaining fleet turn around and head home. Two years later is the second Persian invasion of Greece. This, I, I, I find this crazy that these ancient civilizations have the economy and the manpower and the strategic planning to continue these invasions very close together. You know, it, it's, almost, it's, it's, it's almost as close to modern day military operations as you can get in the ancient world. They've got a navy, they've got an army, they've got a supply line, they have a setback, they're able to send reinforcements and build a whole new group and do it all over again. It's very, very impressive. Is not going to risk sailing along the coast and getting caught in another storm along the treacherous Greek coast. So they sail directly across the Aegean and they land at Eritrea and sack it. They destroy Eritrea. There's a small battle where the Eritreans are crushed, and then they sack the city of Eritrea. Boom, check that box. All right, the first of the Greek supporters to the Ionian Revolt has been punished by the great king of Persia. Now, the Persians leave Eritrea and sail down and land along the northern coast of the little peninsula that has Athens on it, and they land at a place called Marathon. In September of 490 BC, we have the Battle of Marathon. It, can, it is considered one of the most decisive battles in all of history. When you see a list of, you know, 100 battles that changed the world or, you know, top 50 battles of all history, Marathon is usually on it. The Athenians knew that the Persians were coming. Eritrea had just been sacked. They form up their army. They send out for help. They ask the Spartans to come and help, but the Spartans have a religious festival. It always seems that the Spartans have some type of religious festival going on so that they can't fight right now. they got to fight later, so the Spartans can't come and help. But they do get some help from another Greek city-state called Plataea. So you've got Greeks from Athens and Plataea, and you know the numbers are always exaggerated. It's, you know The Herodotus puts it at like 200,000. Modern estimates are more in the 25, 30, maybe a little bit more thousand at this Battle of Marathon. And the Greeks go to form up and fight the Persians. Now, the thing that the Persians do really, really well, well, two things they do really, really well, is the Persian cavalry and the Persian archers. The Persian army has a disproportionate number of archers. And when we get to the movie 300, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But just know that the Persian army has a massive, massive number of archers. And their cavalry is very, very good. The Persians incorporate the different areas that they've conquered and the things that those areas are good at. And they just say basically, okay, well, you just do that for us now because we rule you. But you can still fight the same way. You're good cavalry, be cavalry. You're good archers, be archers. So the Persians are in the middle of landing at the Battle of Marathon. The area rises up to some hills and there's some marshes on either side. So it's kind of a bottleneck area, but it's still a flat, wide open area so that they can beach their ships and land their troops. The Greeks and the Athenians are worried about the Persian cavalry. 
but as far as we know, the Persian cavalry has already landed, but they've gone out scouting. So they're not there. They take no part in the battle. So we've already removed one of the things the Persians do good. The other thing is the bow, and that is obviously still there. The Athenians, the way they command their army is one general's in charge one day, and one general's in charge the next day, and they kind of rotate. Well, some of the Athenian generals want to wait and attack later. Some of the Athenian generals want to attack now before the cavalry comes back and before the, before the rest of the army has time to land. That faction of the Athenian army finally convinces the rest of the commanders that now is the time to attack. So the Greeks form up in the Greek phalanx. They put their strong troops on the edges and their weaker troops in the center. The Persians form up their battle line as well, and they put their strong units in the center and their weak units on the side, and they charge. Herodotus says they ran a mile. We're pretty sure they didn't run that long, but we do know that this this battle is known for the charge, the Athenians charging to the battle. So they know we covered some distance, and these two armies smash into each other. Now, we don't really know exactly how the Greek phalanx fought at this time. Most of the recordings of how the Greek phalanx fought comes from a later time period. So we're not exactly sure if it's the way they fought exactly the same or if it's a little bit differences. But regardless, this Greek phalanx of hoplite spearmen comes into battle with the Persian army with lightly armored spearmen and bowmen to the Greek hoplites. Excuse me. The Greek hoplites are heavy infantry. They're going to be wearing heavy bronze armor. They have a massive shield, a big, strong helmet, and they're going to be wearing some type of breastplate armor. It varies from time. It varies on, you know, the individual soldier who has to provide this, how much money they have. But regardless, the Greek army is heavily armored as a general rule of thumb, while the Persian army itself is very, very lightly armored. They're relying on their bows and the the spears to keep people at bay, and then the Persian cavalry to be the deciding factor. We don't know exactly how many Persians are on the beach, but regardless, we know that the Persian arrow fire was ineffective to these heavy Greek hoplites, and they charge in and begin to fight the Persian army. The Persians' strongest units are in the center, and they begin to push some of the weaker Greek units back. But on the wings, the Greeks are strongest, and they begin to push the Persian forces back. Now, the Persian forces on the wings rout and run away, and this allows the Greek hoplites on the wings to double envelopment, completely encircle the remaining Persian forces, and they annihilate them. And they rout the Persian army, and the Persian army retreats back to their ships, and the Greeks kill a ton of Persians. They capture a few of the Persian ships, and the Persian army and fleet retreat. Now, they don't go home just yet. They still have enough forces that they think they can take Athens, so they sail around to the southern tip of the peninsula to try and take another crack at the city, but the... Greek forces at Marathon force march themselves to the southern side of the peninsula and form up in defense of Athens, and the Persians get there, and they realize, okay, we're we're not going to do this again. We're going home. And that ends the second invasion of Greece by the Persian Empire. Now, it wasn't a complete failure, right? The first one, they conquer Thrace and Macedonia. The second one, they destroy Eritrea. But it's not good enough for the Persians, and Darius begins planning the third invasion of Greece. Now, he dies during this time, and his son Xerxes, who is the key central Persian figure in the movie 300, comes comes to reign. He has to kind of reconsolidate his power and show that he's a worthy king. There's a rebellion in Egypt, there's a rebellion in Babylon that he has to put down, but He's going back to Greece. And so after he puts down these rebellion, establishes that he's the king, that he's in control, he begins to build up an army and a fleet, and they are going to head back and conquer all of Greece. 
And that is what brings us up to kind of the beginning stages of the movie 300. So I hope this gave you some broader context of what's going on in this area. And you can kind of understand why the Persians are coming to Greece and why the Spartans are going to go and fight them and try and stop them from invading their homeland and, and all of this. I know there was a, a lot of names, a lot of places. I hope everyone was able to follow along as best as possible. <laughs> and I'm saying this at the end, but uh, maybe get a map out and help follow along a little bit better. So I look forward to doing or watching the movie and recording the next full episode for the movie 300. Don't forget to find us on Instagram and follow us there. Don't forget to follow us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. It really, really helps us out a lot. So until next time.